All right, what is good TLC? Man, it's good to be home. It's good to be home. It's been uh, it's been two weeks. Missed you guys a lot. You know, everywhere everywhere every time I leave, uh, just for a few weeks, I always think about our church and our family and our body. And it's always good to come home and see uh, familiar faces. Come home and see uh, welcoming faces of our brothers and sisters. So it's good to see you guys again. Uh, we made it back from Cambodia. They all came back alive. Praise the Lord, right? Uh, I don't think we caught anything. I don't think we caught any bugs. So we'll see in a couple of weeks uh, if they show up. But and it was a it was a good mission. It was a great mission. You know, like uh, just really seeing, being a part of creating something from the beginning, right? Um, being part of helping this church uh, really start blessing the community. Um, being a for the for the church to be a blessing to its community and slowly moving from the blessing into really evangelizing and reaching out to its people it's it's being a part of that and i we just felt really good about it we felt um like i was just using the team very well and can't wait to tell you all the stories because there's a lot of stories and a lot of um a lot of moments that just god was just amazing so uh look forward to that in a few weeks in the coming weeks but uh Thank you for your prayers, man. I'm not, you, I, we felt the prayers. I'm telling you, we felt the prayers. It was heavy, and uh, no, so I, I, I think that's why none of us got like tr- detrimentally sick. Like the moment it happened, I think everyone got healed back within like two days. It wasn't so bad. I think some of us were still recovering a little bit from a little stomach bug or a little sore throat, but overall, no one is dead, no one is dying. So praise God for that. All right. A um, couple of announcements. Actually, just one announcement that we have. That we can think of so far. Uh, Friday community group is on summer break. Yeah, Friday community group is on summer break. Right, resumes in September-ish. Right, we're on summer break for now. Enjoy the Fridays. Uh, we want to give you guys your summer. Uh, where you guys go on vacation and stuff like that. So it's on community group. But we'll probably be doing all this stuff. So keep your Fridays open if you're not doing anything. You're bored. Uh, my house is open. So. Uh, VAY rally Friday, July 10th. So we're we're gonna have VA. Why rally, right? Basically, all it is is we want to know who our who our um, who our people are, who's uh, playing, and who's uh, who's who's our members, and who's our our church uh, representatives, and all that stuff. So we want to just gather everybody up and cheer for them, pray for them, and uh, send them off and in style, and so that way we can cheer for them while we're there. One of the beautiful things, and the things that I think the kids are really excited about, is that we're letting the kids play this year, and they're a little scared, because they're like, they, they just keep looking at us and say, like, we're going to lose, and I thought, this doesn't matter, that's not the point, we're going to be cheering you on, right, it's going to be great, and when you win, it's going to be even more fantastic, because then I'm going to just like, yeah, right, all right, so, um, it's good stuff. We're building up for next year. Because next year, we can't bring anybody in anyway. So next year, we're going to have our team ready to go. So praise the Lord for that. We're, we're rebuilding like the Lakers, okay? We're rebuilding like the Lakers. All right. Uh, I think that's it for the announcements. I think that's it for the announcements. Uh, let's, let's bow our heads and let's, uh, let's get started. Uh, Father, I thank you, Lord, for uh, this morning. Thank you, God, for just sending off the AZ team and sending us off, Lord. Um, I pray for the travels. I pray, God, that you would just bless the Evan, uh, Daniel, uh, Marion, and Ann as they drive uh, the vans uh, to Arizona. pray that you give them safe travel while they're there. Uh, Lord, I pray over our congregation as we uh, gather to listen to your word this morning, this afternoon. Lord, I pray that your word would speak and remind us, O oh God, of, of the family in which we belong to. I pray, Lord, that we would just remember your truth and stand to it, O oh God. And be bold in it. And not um, run or hide. But Father, to represent um, your family well. And so, I thank you God. I thank you so much for the love that you have. That you have poured out on us. And I ask, oh God, that in this life we will live to give you glory. We, pray all, we praise you. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, we've been going through the book of 1 John. You know, we've been going through the book of 1 John. Uh, Pastor Leslie came and preached for you guys. Uh, uh, I think it was two weeks ago, two weeks ago, and then Evan preached for you guys last week, yeah, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, if I'm a little slurring on my words, it's because I'm still a little jet lag, okay, and the whole AZ van thing stressed me out this morning. So uh, let, me, let me just try to get my bearings, and we'll, uh, we'll get going. And so if I start busting a little get on this, don't, don't be upset, okay? All right, so we've been talking about 1 John, 1 John. 
John wrote this letter because the church itself was going through kind of like a split. They, they were going through some confusion, confusing times. There was a group of people that came into the church and kind of just spoke uh, a different truth into their life. It kind of just split the church up a little bit and told them that this is who Jesus really is and this is how he really is and this is what you need to do to really have fellowship with him. And John, John being the last and final apostle, the last and final disciple of Jesus who was alive at that time, John writes the letter to this church and he tells them, listen to me. Listen to what I have to say, right? Because I was there. These guys that are come into this place and bewitched you and, and, and try to get you to move away from the truth and get you to break the fellowship of your church and your body, right? To split you guys up, to cause poison, to be twisted in your, in your congregation. Listen to me. I was there from the beginning. I was there as he preached for three years. I was there when he was hung upon the cross. I was there when he rose from the dead. I was there to see him ascend to the heavens. I was there when he commissioned me off into the field. I was there. So listen to me. Okay, I have the authority to speak in who Jesus really is. And as he spoke into these and to this church's life, as he's writing this letter, he's reminding them, this is what it means to be a believer. This is what it means to actually have fellowship with Jesus Christ. This is what it means to actually have fellowship with each other. Not the simple, hey, how you doing, let's grab some boba kind of fellowship. But the fellowship that reaches into the hearts, that, 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 gets, that digs deeper, that asks the tough questions. The fellowship that changes lives, the fellowship that loves, the fellowship that connects you deeply to God, right? He says, let's restore that back in the church. And 1 John chapter 3 talks about the church family. It talks about the church family. He says, how great, church chapter 1 is, how great is the love of the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are, right? How great is the love that the Father has, that, we, that He would lavish upon us, that we would be called children of God, is an adoption. It's an adoption from you are nothing to all of a sudden you are His child, His responsibility, part of His family. You may not understand it at first, you may not understand what's going on, but as you grow into it, as you mature, as you get deeper into it, all of a sudden you realize how great and how awesome this love was that would bring you into His home, right? So it talks about the church family. It talks about the marks of what it means to be part of the church family and how you actually know. Today's message, I want to, I wanna, it's, it's a little heavy. It's a little heavy because he, he adds on something else. He adds on something else because he adds on this idea. Because it's either you are part of God's family or you're not. There is no middle ground around here. There is no gray area. And, and, and I want to preach this message with as much fear and trembling as possible and as much grace and love as possible. But I want to make sure that you guys understand this, this truth that John is saying. It's very important because this passage is very profound in the way it speaks into the human condition. Right? Most people don't think about where their position is in life very well. They don't think it through. They think of it in the surface area, right? but they don't think it through all the way to the end because it's very profound. And what John is saying in this passage that we're about to read is this. That there are exactly two families. There are two spiritual family. And everyone is a part of one or the other. You are part of one or the other. There is no middle ground. There is no second. There is no third. There is no almost there. You are part of one or the other. Right? And he, and he addresses that for us. And I hope you guys understand it because it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to really clear it up for your heart. It's really going to clear it up for where you personally stand as a believer. Okay? It's either you are in the family of God or you're not. Okay? And the second thing he's going to talk about is this. is because there's two families, there has to be opposition. It just has to be. There's going to be conflicts. There's going to be struggles. Right? Because there are two separate spiritual families, there's going to be struggles, conflicts, opposition. And Paul and John was saying, just don't be surprised when it happens. And he says this lastly. He says, but this is how you know you're a part of God's family. This is how you know you have and you are in God's family. 
Okay? So three things. He's going to address the idea of a spiritual, two spiritual families. He's going to talk about opposition. And he's going to give you the mark of what it means to be in a Christian family or a spiritual family. Christian uh, God's family. There are two spiritual families. Two distinct families. Everyone is part of one of two families. It's not some people and the other ones are, are somewhere else. Everyone is part of one or the other. Two. Because there are two families, there are going to be opposition. There's going to be conflict and struggles. Don't be surprised when that happens. And actually expect it to happen. Know that it's happening. Right? Three. But this is the mark of which you do, which you show yourself that you are part of God's family. All right? So open your Bibles. First John chapter 3. First John chapter 3, verses 10. We'll start there. And he begins to address the other family. He begins to address the dichotomy of the two families. And we're going to break it down. Okay? First John chapter 3, verse 10. And this is how we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. See, anyone who does not do what is right is not a child of God, nor is anyone who does not love his brother. This is the message you heard from the beginning. Right? Before, before you got confused by a bunch of people, this was the original message. We should love one another. Do not be like Cain, who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. Right? Everyone belongs to a spiritual family, one or the other. There's two of them, one or the other, okay? We all belong there. See, we live in America, and especially in L.A. and California. We, we, hear, we hear this type of saying a lot. When we ask people about their faith, we ask people about where they stand. Most people say stuff like this. They say, you know, I'm not very religious, right? I, I, I'm, I'm glad you found religion. I'm glad you uh, are willing to take it and go off to a foreign land and do stuff with it. I'm glad that you do it. That's for you. That's a great thing that you're doing. I totally respect that. But that's just not me. I don't, I don't have a personal belief. right? I don't have faith. I, I just don't take those leap of faith that you're, that you're usually talking about. You hear typical things like, I think everyone should make up their own minds towards what is right for them. They should discover what is personally right for them. You, you hear stuff like, I'm not a religious person. Everyone has their own decision. Morality, right and wrong, is really up for them to discover. Right? Morality is based on our own personal decision. You hear stuff like this all the time. Right? When you talk to people. And, and usually they're trying to take the middle ground. They don't want to sound too religious where it becomes really kind of like shaky and they have to make a firm, committed stand. They don't want to sound too um, uh, uh, secular because then that way they, they, it will sound like they don't care for anything. So they try to take this middle ground. Okay? But do you know what this text that John is trying to show us? Do you know what? It, it's so profound in that it really opens up the human condition. It just really just shines light on it. And the fact that this text tells us that those statements are superficial at best. Right? Everybody is in a spiritual family. Everybody has some sort of religion. Everybody's religious. Everyone is spiritual. Everyone has some sort of spiritual value system. Right? They're either, they're, they're either the children of God, John says, or what? They're the children of the devil. Everyone, let me, let me break that down before you guys all trip out. Like children of the devil. I'm not the devil, right? So everyone has a spiritual value, spiritual way in which they look at the world, spiritual way in which they make decisions. Everyone has that. And anyone tells you they don't, they're either they have not thought out their spiritual position very well, or they just kind of say things randomly. Okay? Everyone does. Let me, give me an example. Science does this. Science can always tell you what is happening. Science will always tell you what is. This is what's going on. This is what's going on. This is how it is. This is what it is. This is what it is. But it can never tell you how it ought to be. It can never tell you why it should be. It can never tell you why this is important. The moment you make such a statement... The moment you said, this is what it is, therefore you should do this. The moment you say that, you have put value on something, right? You have entered into the realm of religion. You have entered into the realm of spiritual reality. You're talking about spiritual stuff now. You're no longer talking about science, right? Everyone has spiritual values. 
They may not think it's spiritual values, but it's spiritual values. Everyone is saying, everyone is giving the religious statement. The moment you're saying that, the moment you're saying stuff like, I don't have faith, we should all discover our own belief system, everyone should discover what's right for them, if it's right for you, it's right for you. If it's good for me, it's good for me. We should respect that. Now, the moment you say that, you reveal to yourself that you yourself have your own spiritual value system. You have a religion. You know what your religion is? Do you know what you're really believing? You're believing this. You're believing that there is no judgment day. You're believing that whatever you do, whatever it is that you say, whatever it is that you do now in this life, there will be no judgment for it. There will be no judge, immutable judge, who could declare what is right and what is wrong. You are firmly putting your whole entire destiny into the belief system that that is not going to happen. You have no way to prove it, but you are firmly believing in it. The moment you say every value is right to their, to their own eyes, everyone is the captain of their um, the captain of, or is this the phrase, everyone is the master of their own faith, the captain of their own soul. The moment you say that, you're basically saying, I'm in control. You're putting a spiritual value on a statement. You're becoming religious. You are part of a spiritual family. Don't you understand that? The moment you say that, you are a part of a spiritual family already. So when someone says, I'm not religious, I can't take that leap of faith, they say, don't be ridiculous. You've already kept, you already took the leap of faith. What is the leap of faith that they took? There is no judgment. I completely believe there will not be a judge waiting for me. I completely believe there will be no judgment waiting for me. Instead of saying that God is my judge, they say I'm my own judge. Instead of saying that I'm living to serve God, they're saying I'm living to serve myself. Instead of saying that only God is competent to run my life, they're saying I'm the one confident to run my life. It becomes that. And do you know who was the first created being that made this religion? Who was the first created being that allowed this to happen? It was the devil. It was Satan. For he was the first one that says, God, you take your hands off. It's my hands. My will be done, not your will be done. Right? Everyone believes in something. Don't let anyone ever fool you that they're somehow being totally neutral. Don't let anyone totally fool you to believe that somehow their religion, they're, they're respecting everyone else's religion. The moment they say that, they have already made a religious value themselves. And they've already took a leap of faith into their system of life. They've already done it. They don't fully thought about it, they've done it, but they've already done it. And John's saying, what John is saying is, is very profound because you have to think it through because most people don't think it through. John is saying there are two spiritual family. One who is born from God. How lavish is the love of God. How great is the love of God that he would lavish upon us. That he would call us children of God. And that's what we are. Part of his family. Adopted into his home. Right? Or our second. I'm in control of my faith. I am the master of my faith. I am the captain of my soul. I am in control. See, then you belong to another spiritual family. You belong to a spiritual family that cried out from the beginning of time, from the dawn of time, the one who cried out, Oh Lord, not your will, but my will be done. Who said, Oh God, you take your hands off of me. I will be in control of my faith. You follow after that family. You see, there's only one or two families. And it's very profound because most people think they're being neutral by, being, by saying that they're atheistic or they're, um, they're just really open to spirituality or not even they're not spiritual at all. Whatever it is, the reality is they've already made a spiritual leap. They've already decided in their heart there is no judgment. There is no judge. There is nothing already there. I t they firmly believe there is nothing there. Therefore, my life can be done as I please. Therefore, I can do as I wish. Therefore, I can be in control and nothing will happen. You guys see that? Right? One or two families. That's what John is saying. It's a huge, profound thing. 
Right? Do you see the implication, the religious implication of your position? Right? One cries out, I am the master of my faith, the captain of my soul. The other one cries out, O Lord, you are the author and perfecter and finisher of my faith. One cries out, O God, I live this life to serve you. The other one says, I live this life to serve me. One cries out, God, you are my judge. You alone can judge. The other one cries out, I will be my own judge. I will decide what happens to me. One cries out, God, you are competent. You, you alone are competent to run my life. The other one cries out, I know exactly what I'm doing. I will run my own life. There was only one or two families. There was only two families. And we all belong to one or the other. Right? We all do. You don't have to like it, but think it through. Think it through. Is that not you? Is, do you have you not put your whole... If, if that's the cry that you've been usually been saying, that you know, I'm in control, it's all about me. Think about it. Have you not truly com- convicted in your own heart that there is no judge? That's why you can say that. Have you not already not believed in your own soul that you already made that leap of faith? That there is nothing after this? There cannot be anything? Therefore, my decision is my own decision? My judgment is by my own hands? Haven't you already made Have you thought it through? Two families, was John is saying. He says, this is how we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. Right? We should love one. Do not be like Cain who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. You begin to be a part of this system, this, this, this legacy This family that's cried out for generations. I'm in control of my life. Not you, God. I'm the one that knows what's up. I'm the one that can be responsible. I'm the one that knows how far I can take things. I'm the one that knows where things can go. I'm the one. Right? There's two families. There's two spiritual families. Everyone is part of a spiritual family. Everyone is. Everyone is religious. Don't ever let anyone... Fool you into thinking that they are somehow neutral in their belief system. Everyone who makes a value system has already believed in something. Right? They have. They've already believed in something. The way things ought to be or the way things should be, they've already believed in something. Okay? So that's the first thing. The question I want to ask is that, you know, what family do you believe in, church? What family are you in? Because I know we all go to church, so we, we kind of like, kinda, oh, I'm, I'm in God's family. But reality... What family are you in? Where, where is it that you put your allegiance? Where is it that you put your trust and your control into? I'm not saying complete control. I'm saying there's, where is it that there's a journey of letting God take control? Right? Where is, is it, are you on a journey where you are, you, are, you are consistently allowing God to take control more and more of your life? Or are you on a journey that's taking more and more control of your own personal life? Where are you? Are you on a journey that is consistently allowing God to speak truth into your life? Or are you on a consistent journey saying, I know what's up. I'll be part of church for the cover, whatever basis I need to cover in life, right? But the reality, the one who's truly in control is me. And you know what John is saying there? The moment you understand that, the moment that clicks, it's the moment you know exactly what family you belong to. It's the moment you know exactly which family you belong to. All right? So first thing, there's two families. Second thing, right? Because there are two families, there is what? Opposition. Look at verse 13. Do not be surprised, my brothers, if the world hates you. Do not be surprised, my brothers, if the world hates you. All right? Because there are two families, there's going to be two opposing values, two opposing opinions, two constant struggles. There's going to be ups and downs. There's going to be 
dis disagreement. There's going to be anger and animosity. There's going to be disagreement between the two value systems. Don't be surprised that the world with the value system that teaches I am the master of my faith, the captain of my soul, would be in opposition with the one who cries out, O oh Lord, you are the author, perfecter, and finisher of my faith. Right? Don't be surprised at this opposition. That's actually how you know where you stand. That's actually how you know that you are in a specific family because there's an opposition there. See, when God speaks truth into your life with his words about life, about, about life and about who you are, about the things that he's calling into you to do, do you sense an opposition against that right away? Is there a hatred against that? Is there an anger towards that? Or is there a submission to it? Or maybe there's something that goes on in the world today, some politically correct thing for this moment in time, and as it comes, and the new fad comes in, and you just totally submit to it. That it's all right. You're totally into it. It's totally fine. Right? It reveals the moment. If there is no opposition, whatever opposition you find yourself in, whichever side of the opposition you find yourself in, that reveals where you are in this family. Isn't it? I love coming back from missions because usually I, I let myself get hit with all the news. Uh, it's really cool, you know. First, um, Golden State Warriors, NBA champions, woohoo, right? Uh, second, Lakers um, picked the point guard for their uh, for the second round pick. I'm not so sure about that one, but we'll uh, we'll trust Mitt Kupchak in that one, right? Uh, third, Supreme Court decision, five to four, right? Uh, same-sex marriage across the land. And, like, I saw all these Facebook posts about it. Man, it was crazy. My, my, Because, you know, I know a lot of Christians are, like, constant Facebook posts about it. Like, blah, and then I got some political ones. I went crazy on here, and, this, and there's, like, a bunch of articles came here. And people were just surprised. And I'm like, why are you surprised? It was going to happen, right? It was inevitable. Why are you so surprised? What you should think about is this, all right? Not to be so surprised, but to realize this. First, Jesus is still alive, okay? Jesus rose from the dead. We believe that. He conquered sin. He is alive. Things are good, right? Things are good. Second, his kingdom will come. It's not, a, you just didn't stop all of a sudden, okay? His kingdom didn't stop because the U.S. Supreme Court made a decision. His kingdom will still come. Third, what happens? His will will still be done, where? On earth, as it is in heaven. It has not stopped, right? So don't be so surprised that your life is, or things are going to be so hard and life is going to be over, right? It's not. Jesus is still alive. Praise the Lord, right? God's kingdom will still come. It's not going to stop. His will is going to still be done. It doesn't matter who's, who tries to get in the way of it. His will is going to be done. No matter how crazy things get, his will will still be done, right? People get all surprised about it. They all get upset about it. All like, and it's good. I mean, it's a sad day for America and for the, the whole idea of marriage in general, right? And, and it means this. It means that Christians are no longer allowed to enjoy the privileges of faith that we're used to and accustomed to. You know, we've been pretty spoiled in America, right? We've been pretty spoiled in America in the fact that we can enjoy such freedom of faith. All it means is that we're just not allowed to do it anymore, right? That's all it means. It doesn't really stop anything. And now what it really means is that you actually have to stand up and speak out for what you really believe in. All right? You're, you're going to actually have to face whatever opposition and ridicule that may come from it to the obedience of Jesus Christ. That's all it means. You're going back to where the Christians back in the days were facing. Same thing. Right? The whole, the whole nations back then didn't believe what the Christians believed in. They stood face total opposition to it. Do you know what they said to their hearts though? That we're going to be obedient to Christ no matter what. You know, the moment I read that, the moment I read that, this is what came to my heart. I said this to myself. I don't know why I said it, but I said to myself, Lord, I am, I'm ready to go to jail if, if I have to, like, uh, say no to uh, performing a marriage or whatnot. And I'm ready to actually be sued. Oh, Lord, I don't have much, but, you know, they, they can't take much from me anyway. So I'm ready to be sued if such and such happens. But, Lord, I just pray for the courage to be able to stand up to it when it happens. Right? That's all I ask for. You shouldn't be surprised at this opposition. You should, being in God's family, and there is another family out there, you should not be surprised the opposition comes. You should not be surprised. Right? But take hope that Jesus is alive. Right? Take hope that you know that you went from death to life because of what he's done. 
take hope the fact that he says what? I am returning, that his kingdom will come, that his will shall be done. You know, all the time, oh my goodness, let me tell you guys something. Every time we say the Lord's Prayer, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Every time we say that prayer and we don't see it happening, you know what's going on? It's just being built up. God is just being, God is just building those prayers up. He's allowing for those prayers to just come and flow. And then he's going to pour it out. He's going to pour his will on the earth. It's going to come. His will will be done on this earth. There is no opposition that can stand to it. Right? So don't be surprised when opposition comes your way. Don't be surprised when uh, people attack you for your faith. Don't be surprised when... You know, I actually had a conversation. I had a conversation with my cousin the other day. And um, so she told me, like, he told me, like, seriously, man, do you uh, believe in gay marriage or same-sex marriage? I said, so that's a loaded question because you don't really want me to answer you. You want to basically just get mad at me for being a pastor. She says, maybe, right? I said, okay. Let me ask you the same question. i ask you back a question. And if you answer my question, I'll answer yours. Okay? Because that's how you do it. Okay? You play the question game, right? <laughs> so, so they're going to ask you a question. You ask them a question. First, I say, hey, is sexuality the only thing that matters about, uh, in a person? Is it the main identifying factor of that person? She said, no. I said, okay, then I do believe in same-sex. I, I do believe. I do not believe in same-sex marriage. Right? I don't believe in it. Um, But here's the same thing. I do believe that sexuality is not what defines a person, right? I believe that there is more to a person than that. And I don't know why we're making it the main category. See, the main issue for Christians shouldn't be the battle of marriage. The main issue that Christians should have is the battle for the gospel of Jesus Christ to be known, right? We stand up for marriages, of course. And as Christians, we need to be more wise about our marriages. We need to engage in marriage uh, in a very... Uh, wise way. We need to learn the idea of repenting. We need to learn the idea of not letting divorce be the option of our marriages. Right? We need to discipline, as a church, we need to discipline couples that get into those mindset, right? And not let that happen, right? But here's the thing, you guys. There's two families. There's two families out there, okay? God's family and the family that is opposed to God's family, and because there's an opposition, because there's a second, there's going to be opposition. You're going to face it at work. You're going to face it at school. You're going to face it wherever you go. And when you face it, when you face it, I pray that you have the courage to stand under the truth of God. Because this is what he says. This is the mark of the Christian faith right here. This is the mark of how you are to respond and how you know that you are in the faith and in part of the family of God. It says, verse 14, we know that we have passed from death to life because we love our brothers. Anyone who does not love remains in death. Anyone who hates his brother is a murderer and you know that no murderer has eternal life in him. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need, but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? Dear children, let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions and in truth. Let us not love with words or tongue, but with action and truth. Action has to be guided by what? By truth. You love with action, but you love with action guided by truth. You don't just love for the sake of loving. There needs to be a truth that guides your love. Right? Do you know why love is the, the mark of the Christian life? This is how radical it is. Let me tell you why. In verse, uh, verse 11, this is the message you heard from the beginning. John was saying, from the beginning you heard. From the beginning you knew that this was what Christians was about. Let me tell you. From the beginning in the book of Acts chapter 11, at the city of Antioch was the, begin- the first place Christians were called Christians. You guys realize that? Christians weren't called Christians throughout the whole entire Bible uh, up to that chapter. The whole time they were called followers of the way. But at Antioch, at this city, people called them Christians. Do you know why? Something about what happened. Antioch is the most 
ethnically diversity in that time. Ethnically, there's so many different races in that area. So many different races in that area is that, that they actually built walls to separate one group from the other. They had walls separating Syrians from Jews, from Greeks, right? And they thought nothing of it. It's like, you know, if you're Greek, can I just congregate together? If you're, if you're a Jew, congregate together. If you're Syrian, congregate together. If you're an African, congregate together. They built walls separating the groups. And all of a sudden, in, book of, uh, in the book of Acts, we have Christians coming into the city of Antioch, preaching the gospel, People were hearing the news. People were receiving it. People were becoming believers. The news went all the way back to Jerusalem. Jerusalem couldn't believe it. This ethnically diverse area, so different in their culture, so prideful in their culture. How is it possible that they are receiving Christ? They sent Barnabas and Saul into the city. Barnabas and Saul went in, saw what happened, was encouraged, brought back the news, and this is what they said. This is what happened. Do you know why? Antioch was such a crazy place where I was called Christians for the first time because people were crossing the walls. Believers were crossing the walls. People were coming to Christ across the walls. Jews were all of a sudden associating with Syrians. Syrians. Syrians were all of a sudden, all of a sudden associating with Greeks and Rome. Greeks and Romans were all of a sudden associating with Africans. They were all crossing walls and barriers of culture and pride and whatever and politics. They were all crossing borders, class ranks, in order to because of some because of what the message was being said, right? They were crossing walls. Worship was being held across the area. Do you know what was happening? Right? The message of the gospel has its power to get people to love in spite of everything. Because the message of the gospel lays everyone equal. There is no one above the other. Every faith at that time, every faith at that time, even today, almost every faith at that time demands a couple things. The Jewish faith demands that you actually have to become Jewish in culture. To get circumcised, do all the whole Jewish customs, then you are considered to be a follower of Judaism. Right? The Greeks and Roman philosophy, you actually have to be smart. So all the poor people had no idea what they were talking about, they didn't follow after the Greek and Roman philosophies. Right? There were mystery religions back then, but you have to be rich to be in it because mystery religion requires initiation, and initiation requires money. They had to give money. Right? Christianity, for some reason, right, was so inclusive of everybody, rich or poor, High class, low class. One culture to the other culture. It it included everybody. Everyone was associating with each other. Everyone was bounded to each other. It's also so simple enough. The message of the gospel is so simple that the poor understood it. And yet the message of the gospel was also so deep in in its profound thoughts that it transformed and converted the minds of the, the most amazing people throughout history. Right? It included women. It, it allowed women uh, to be part of the faith. Most faiths back then did not allow women. Women were the outskirts. Men were the ones who practiced the religion. Women were the ones just kind of associating with it. Right? Christianity was the first religion that allowed for that to happen. But you know what historians cannot understand? They cannot understand the original reason why they were so inclusive. What made Christianity want to be inclusive? What was it that brought Christianity to Christians to be this inclusive? And the only answer they can give, the only answer that kind of makes sense was this. The unique message of Jesus Christ. The unique message of Jesus Christ. Do you guys know what the gospel tells us, you guys? The gospel tells us that we're all sinners. There is no one good. See, all religion says there is a difference between a good person and a bad person. You want to be a good person. Don't be a bad person. You know what Christianity tells you? We're all bad. Okay? We're all bad people. The only difference is we are bad people who believe in God. Who believe in Jesus Christ. See, that's why people, they get this, even Christians, even in some Christian circles, we get this religious action that goes on sometimes. We get this idea that you have to be somehow good in order to be a Christian. You have to be good in order actually to enter into the church. You have to be right with God in order to be here. That is ridiculous. That is ridiculous. The reason why the church blew up, the reason why Christians were so, uh, so dramatic in the way they reached out and loved people, do you know why? It's because the gospel leveled everyone. It, re- it reminded everyone that you're all sinners, 
You are messed up. If not by the grace of Jesus Christ, you would still stay messed up. That's why a doctor can never look at a peasant and say, I'm better than you. A doctor would look at a peasant and say, who do I think that I am when I myself am saved by faith? Why do, how dare I think that I am better than this gentleman right here? Right? Who makes less, who has less than me. How dare that I think I am better than them when I myself am saved by grace. This brother is my brother. Right? So that's where how dare you would think as Christians, the mark of a Christian is the, the way you love. And how dare you think that somehow you are a believer and a follower of Christ and there's unforgiveness in your heart. Right? That with the same lips you use to praise the Father, you use the exact same lips to curse your brothers and your sister? Who do you think you are when you say that somehow, God, I know that you have forgiven me, but I cannot forgive them? God, I know that you have saved my life, but I cannot bear or, or try to reach out to so-and-so? That I can't be a blessing to them? And somehow... My time is so much more important than theirs. That somehow their value of life is not as important as mine. That somehow I am more deserving than they are. Do you know what made their mission a lot better at, at Cambodia? Is when we finally, when I told the team, look, why did you guys come? Did you guys come to accomplish something and to make yourself feel good about it? Is that why you came? Because then you came for you. You didn't come for God. And your mission is going to be as disappointing as you will ever get if you come with that mindset. If you come thinking to yourself, God, I have to accomplish something in order to feel good. I need to do something right to feel like I've made it, my, I've made it somehow. If you come with that mentality, you've come with this thought, this thought process that it's about you. Would you come with this idea that here you are to bless people? That God has given you the privilege to bless and to love upon someone else, to see these kids as equals, to see these brothers and sisters as equals, and that you're not somehow better, that you're bringing them better stuff, but you are loving upon them, that you're caring for them. That's the mark of a Christian. And when we, when I think when we finally understood that, the mission became a lot more joyful. It became more just relaxing. It became more of a, a time of just loving on people and, and fellowshipping and breaking bread together. It became like the church that was once supposed to be, right? This is how you know, you guys, you belong to God's family. There's only two families out there. Listen, there's only two families out there. Don't be fooled. Don't think that somehow you're in the middle ground. Don't think that, you know, Tony, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of working my way towards Jesus. I'm like somewhere around the middle here. I'm in the gray area. Brothers and sisters, John is saying this, is either you are children of God, you're a son of God, you're a daughter of God, or you're not. That's it. It's either you are his son, his daughter, or you're not. All right? So that's the question you have to ask first. Which family are you in? Be honest about it. Be honest about your own position in life. Do you realize that a lot of you are just seeking personal control? That's all you do. We're just seeking personal control. And you think that that control is somehow going to save you. You think that somehow being in control of your faith, being in control, being, trying to sound like you're being as, 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 as neutral and as politically correct as possible, that it's going to give you this kind of aura of understanding. You're not. John just, John just cuts right through it. He says, look, if you're talking like that, and that's the way you're thinking, let me just give it to you straight. You, either you're a part of God's family or you're not. Either you are in this house or you are not. There is no middle ground here. And if you are in the family, this is how you know too, there's going to be opposition. Where do you find the opposition from? As a believer, do you find opposition? If you have no opposition as a believer, you really got to check out your, your personal faith in Jesus Christ, right? If there is opposition, where is it coming? Is it coming from the outside, right? Or is it coming from the inside? If it's coming from the inside, right, could it be that you, your foot is actually on the outside of the church instead of on the inside? If it's coming from the outside, right? Then maybe it is that you are a believer and you're a part of God's family. But this is how you know. The true sign is there love in your life. Is there love in your life? Do you look at someone and somehow think that you're better? 
Do you look at someone and believe in your heart that you are actually above them? Do you look upon someone and actually think, or let's go the opposite way. Do you think, do you look at someone and think you're actually inferior to them? Do you actually look at someone and feel pity for yourself because you feel like you're not there? Do you look up at people and say, you know, I wish I was there. I wish I would make it. I wish I was at that person. And you, and, and you get mad at God that you were not there yet, that you're still stuck in this rut that you're in in life or whatnot. Either one, you guys, either one of those ones reveals this. It reveals that you don't know the gospel. Because if you know the gospel, it levels the playing field. And once it levels the playing field, loving people becomes easy. Forgiving people, it's hard, right? Because we're still sinners, but it, you can actually begin the process of doing it. You can actually begin the process of doing it. Do you know why? Do you know how you can actually begin it? The actual power that comes from it is not because you're commanded to do so. It's because that's now who you are. It becomes your identity. Your identity begins to be worked out. Every faith out there, every religion out there, let's say, let's, let's, let's be real. Every religion out there basically says the same basic tenets, right? Honor your parents. Be nice to the poor. Live. Don't live outside your means. Basically, every faith, don't lie, don't steal. Every faith has some sort of tenets like that, right? Every faith has this answer to it, though, when they ask you why. Because you need to get somewhere. You need to become something. Christianity says, honor your parents. Don't steal. Love your neighbor. Do you know why they tell you that? Because it says that's who you are. That's already who you are. You just have to live it out now. Have you forgotten who you are? Right? See, if you remember who you are, loving upon people, breaking barriers, breaking bounds, it becomes easy. Because you already know who you are. Nothing they say can affect you or break you one way or the other. You know who you are. You can reach out. You can love upon people. You can give without having to think that you're losing something. Or you can give without having the thought that you have to receive something back. You can walk without being offended. You don't have to live with this pride on your shoulder. You know, like, I want to be respected. I need people to understand me. You already know who you are. And when you already know who you are, none of those things get in the way. Love begins to flow. Do you know the gospel? Is the gospel in your life, church? Is the gospel part of your life? Right? Are you you being transformed by it? Are you being changed by it daily? Do you hear it? Or are you simply just saying, I believe it. I know it. But there's actually no change from it. John is saying something very profound here about the human heart. Right? He's saying we all believe in something. We know you do. We all believe in something. Right? He's saying you believe one family or the other. And he says if you are part of the family of God, you will know that there will be opposition. Don't be surprised. Right? And this is how you know, too. If you're not part of the family of God, the opposition doesn't come. Because you're on the other side. Why would the opposition come for you? Right? Or you know that you're struggling or you know that you're, 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 you're not part of the family because when God's truth begins to speak into your heart and the first thing you do is you block it out. So I'm not going to listen to this. Pastor is being crazy again, right? He's talking the crazy stuff, you know? I like it when he talks about the good stuff. Let's, let's not go to the crazy stuff, right? And it, and it, and it, and it offends you and it hurts you and you, don't, and, you shut the, and you shut yourself out from it. You don't want to listen to it. Which family are you in? And the mark, of the, the mark of the one who's from the family of God is love. Love. Right? Can you guys love, church? Can we just think about this? What would happen if true love community actually lived out true love? Right? If we looked at our neighbors and not see them as a, as a burden of our time. But actually look at them and say, you are a brother and a sister. I want to love upon you. You're a human being that I want to bless. What would happen if true love community actually looked upon our young kids and not think that they're, uh, we have to wait for them to mature up before we can actually communicate with them, but actually look upon them with love and say, let me bless you. 
Let me find a way to actually bless you. What would happen if you start looking into your workplace instead of trying to think of ways to move up in life or whatnot, but thinking of how can I bless this place? That God has placed me here, placed me here. How can I be a blessing to this place? You see, those who keep calling themselves Christians and have to keep um, saying it out loud are the ones who probably aren't so sure of their faith themselves, right? Is like, you know those you know those guys who walk around and say I'm a baller, right? Those are the ones that you know aren't ballers, okay? They're just probably just all talk, you know? It's it's the one it's the one who doesn't say anything and actually does it. Then you're like, ooh, right? Who actually goes out into the court and actually um, ball as in baller, not like rich baller, okay? I'm not talking about that, right? <laughs> like actual ballers, right? And just like, I'm a baller, you know, like, and they go out. And those who don't say anything, they actually go out and let, and let their action and the truth of their action speak for them, right? So you don't have to go out and tell people you're a Christian and proclaim it to the world. And say, I'm a Christian, you know, I'm a Christian. The fact that you would go out and your action is driven by your truth, do you know what happens? If you let the church in Antioch, people look at them and say, those people actually look like God. They're followers of Jesus. I don't know who this Jesus is, but they're followers of him, right? Let's call them Christians. They're so radical. They're so revolutionary. We have never seen such a love before. Let's call them Christians. They're in a class of their own. We need to call them that. We lost that as a church and as a whole. We lost that as a community in this, in this country, I think. And we and we've constantly have to rely upon um, laws to keep us going. But the reality is this. Just be a believer. Just be what you are. Be what God has made you. And just live it out. Live it out. Live out the faith. You don't need to be commanded to do it. It comes from you. You're not trying to become something. You're not trying to become a Christian. You're not trying to be a a son of God. You're already a son and daughter of God. You're just living it out now. You're just allowing for it to happen. And and let me give you one last example. I just want to hit this point because I really need you guys to understand this because there's so many times, so many times we, we really think that we need to become something, okay? When that's who we are. And I think I gave an example. The Undercover Bosses, I love that show, right? Because I know these bosses know who they are. And I, and I just laugh at the employees that diss their boss, right? They're going in there, they're yelling at their boss, and the boss is just like, okay. Right? And, you know, anyone else you would feel bad, but for this guy, you don't feel bad. Cause you, and he doesn't feel bad either. You know why? Because he knows exactly who he is already. He knows exactly his position, his title. And he knows exactly that this guy is doing this, is do, trying to control and belittle him to make him feel smaller and little so that he can, you know, feel like he's management, blah, 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 right? And the boss knows. He takes it in, doesn't phase him. He takes it in. Like, I know you can say all these things, but it doesn't phase me. You know why it doesn't phase me? Because I already know who I am. I'm your boss, fool, right? You're, you're going to be so screwed when I reveal this to you, right? You already know. He already knows. So he's unfazed by that. He, he's unfazed because he knows his identity. In the same way, Christians, when you know your identity, you're unfazed by what people say. You're, un, you're unfazed whether people are above you in life or they're below you in life or you feel like people like, are better than you. And you don't feel like you're better than people. You're unfazed by the statements of those things. And then you're able to do what? Just love. Your love across boundaries. Your love across borders. You love everyone, regardless of race, culture, politics. You're able to sexual orientation. You're able to actually love Right? That's the mark of a Christian. Right? Our mark is not to go out there, you guys, and, and, and go all crazy and, you know, and, and get all mad. I mean, I get so upset when I read these uh, Facebook posts. I don't know why I keep reading them, but I get so upset when I read them because I'm like, why are you guys so mad? Why are you guys so mad? You act like this is, this is, like this is new information. You act like this wasn't going to happen. This is going to happen the moment the case went into the Supreme Court. You knew it was going to happen. Right? The whole culture is shifting that way. What you should be thinking, what you should be doing in your heart is what? Oh, Lord, give me the courage to stand my faith when it needs to be stood, but give me the heart to love regardless of what happens. Right? To love across boundaries and borders, but to be convicted in my faith so, to such a degree that I will not back down if it comes to me. I will not back down if I have to be opposed to it. Right? 
Your kingdom is, God's kingdom is already going to be accomplished. You're not going to worry about it. The worst that can happen is that you get jailed and you die, all right? And you go to heaven. Praise the Lord, okay? There's a lot of things that, you know, you know, going back to Cambodia and coming back here, I just had this kind of this revelation in my head. I'm thinking like, man, the things that we worry about in the first world problems are really just first world problems, right? I mean, like some of the, they're honestly first world problems. And you're like, man, there are so many bigger things out there to worry about. Yeah, there, there are people like dying and not having water. And there's, there's like issues out there that we can really be really fighting for, right? And we worry about the smallest things, you know, a small, you know, honestly, let me tell you something. If I transplanted all of Cambodia over to California, we would not have a drought problem, right? We would not have a drought problem because they don't, they don't treat water the way we treat water, right? They were just like, you know, because, you know, when they shower, they're just going to shower and they're done. We, we don't shower. We kind of like dance in it for ages, you know? Them is just like, it's, it's just for a purpose. Shower, I'm done, you know? It's, it's things like that, like small things like that. Crazy, Okay. What is John saying? Samir, just reiterate. You're part of one or the other. There is no middle ground here. I know, I know, and I, and I prayed about this a lot last night when I, was, when I was preparing in my heart, and I was like, you know, this, this can come off really, really sad. It can come off really, really mean. But let me just be honest with you. Scripture teaches that we're either children of God or children of the devil. One or two families. One or two. There's no middle ground here. This is very profound. And whatever philosophical ideas that you think that's going to keep you neutral, the reality is you're one or the other. Okay? And if you're part of that family, whatever family, you're going to face opposition. The question is, where is your opposition coming from? Is it coming from the Word of God or is it coming from the outside? See, if it's coming from the outside, you really have to pray and to say, God, I know I am your son. I know that I'm your daughter. And I sense this opposition coming in. And Lord, help give me the courage to face it. If it's coming from the Word of God, the opposition is coming from the word of God, and you need to repent, right? And say, oh God, all my life I've declared and I've said to myself that I'm a believer of you. And yet when push comes to shove, when your word is spoken and I need to be obedient to it, I find, it, I find myself hardening my heart to its words. And I don't want to listen. I don't want to listen when it talks about marriage. I don't want to listen when it talks about my sexuality. I don't want to listen when it talks about singleness. I don't want to listen when it talks about life. I don't want to listen when it talks about forgiveness. I don't want to listen when it talks about anger and management. I don't want to listen when it talks about pride. I harden myself to it. Where's your opposition coming from? Right? And the question is this. Is your life marked with love? Is it marked with love? Is it marked with love? Most people run. When opposition comes, right? And that's how you know you have an issue, right? Most people run. Don't run, church, right? Stand firm. Stand true. Right? Stand true. Let's bow our heads. Let's pray. Can we spend some time in prayer this morning as we just begin to uh, come to the Father? Can I ask you guys a question? Can I ask you a few questions? Which is your, the value system of your life? Are you one who says this? I am my own judge. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. Or do you say, O oh Lord, you are my judge. You are the author and perfecter of my faith. Where do you stand when it comes to say, O oh Lord, I live this life because you have given yours to me. So I live this life now, everything I have to serve you. Or do you say, really, God, this life is for me. I'm living to serve myself, my interests, my purpose, my vision, my desires. Do you live to say, oh, God, you are the one who knows what's best for me. Or do you live to say, I'm the one who knows what's best for me. You hands, You take your hands off. You take your hands off of my life. You stop speaking into my life. I am the one who knows what's best for me. Can I tell you guys? Can I ask you guys something? All right. Let's be real. You know that that's your belief system. And you know that you have already committed to a belief. You have leapt and you have gambled your whole entire eternal destiny on the thought that God is not real, that there is no judge, that there is no such thing as a right and wrong, that you can do as you please and you will be okay. 
You already gambled your t- destiny on it. Can you, do you want to not gamble? Are you so sure? Are you that adamantly sure of yourself? Have you thought of your position fully through yet? Are you really going to gamble that away? Or will you listen to what John says as he speaks into the human condition? There is a God who so desires and so loves to lavish upon us his love, to call us his children, to bring us into his home. There is a God who is the author and perfecter of our lives, who is desiring more and more that you would surrender your life into his hands, that you would let go of your control, to let go of your personal pride your personal wants, your personal desires, and you give it to Him. Brothers and sisters, which family are you in? Where do you stand? Can we come? Can there be a time of repentance? And if, and if you are in the family, can you ask God for this? If you are part of God's family, you know it in your heart. Can you pray for this? God, give me the courage to face the opposition that's to come. Give me the courage to be bold like the, like the Christians of long ago who cared not for what government taught or what government said or who cared not for what punishment was brought down, who cared for only one and one thing only, that the name of their God would never be dishonored upon their lips, who lived for one purpose and one purpose only, that their God would be glorified and that he would receive the reward of his suffering. Would you ask God for courage to stand amidst whatever opposition that comes your way? And thirdly, would you pray for this church? Would you pray, oh God, give me, grant me the heart to love. Help me to see the gospel so clearly, so real, so true, that it brings me to a place where I can love with peace and joy. That I don't have to constantly try to prove myself or constantly trying to make myself look like I'm better but be so free that I can love upon people let's come before the Father let's pray right now those three things let's pray Father God, this is our prayer, Lord. The prayer is that you will call your people home. That God, that they will think through the spiritual implication of their position. They don't, they stop dancing around this neutral area, oh God. That you will call them home. That they will surrender their control over to you, oh Lord. That they will stop thinking, Lord God, that they are still 
in control, that they will surrender that to you, Jesus. I pray for our brothers and sisters, oh God, in this time, in this generation. Help us not to be afraid, oh Lord. Help us not to be afraid because you have risen. You are alive. You are resurrected, oh Jesus. Your kingdom will come and your will shall be done. Help us not to be afraid, but to be courageous now more than ever. Oh God, help us to raise, help within our church to raise up godly men, oh Lord, who will take your word and stand by it, who will lead their wives and their future wives by the word, oh Lord. Help us, oh God, to be people who live by truth, that we're not going to dance around the topic but we will be honest and we will be loving we will be truthful and we will be obedient to the family which we have been called into and oh God I pray for this I pray that love would breathe in TLC that you will let love breathe oh Lord that there will not be judgment oh God upon our actions but there will be growth and consistency in love They will not look down upon people, God, but that we will look to them with empathy and compassion. That we will not see ourselves as lower or we will not see ourselves as somehow better. But we will see ourselves in the eyes of the gospel, all sinners in need of love, in need of grace. So, Lord, this is our prayer. Oh, Lord, this is our cry. Would you come, Holy Spirit? Would you come and bring your change here in this house? Would you remind us, O oh God, that you are alive, that you are alive, and love, love needs to breathe in us, O oh God. Come and do your work, O oh God. We pray all these things in Jesus' name.